continue to go through a three-part series on prayer, I invite you this morning to turn to 1 John chapter 5. We take a look at verses 13 through 15 this morning. If you're using a pew Bible, you find this on page 1023. But if you're a guest this morning and you don't have a Bible, take that pew Bible out. Feel free to take it with you when you leave so you have a Bible you can read throughout the week. But before we actually read God's Word and hear God speak to us through His preached Word, I invite you to join me in prayer, asking God's blessing upon that which He has for us this morning. Please join me. Lord God, we do come before this morning thanking you and praising you that you hear us when we pray, that you remind us how to pray, not in our will, but in your will. So we ask that you might mold and shape us to do just that. Help us, Lord, to be attentive to you, even as you're attentive to our prayers. Help us be attentive now, Lord, to hear as you speak to us, Lord. Help your word to go forth the clarity and the boldness, Lord. Be with me, your servant. Let no one choose leave my mouth, my mouth Lord, but only your word given for the edification of your people, for turning hearts to yourself. We ask these things, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So 1 John chapter 5, beginning at verse 13, a section that shows us how God hears us when we pray, as long as we pray according to his will. So give your attention now to God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked. Okay. Stan has given up on prayer. He's saying, why bother? What's the point? God ain't listening. And you know why he's thinking this? Because he's been praying for his friend's salvation, and he didn't go to church. He's been praying for more time to share the gospel, and he's busier than ever and has less time. He's been praying for clear direction, and he's still dazed and confused. He's been praying for his mother's health, and she's not getting any better. In fact, she's getting worse. And he's praying for clear direction and guidance. What should I do? How should I go? What should I do with my job? I need a new job. And you know what? He's working in the same old place. So he's throwing his hands up in the air and saying, why bother? What's the point? Why should I pray when God ain't listening? Can you relate? You ever been where Stan's at? Praying and praying and praying and it seems like God ain't listening? It can be very common, right? I want you to understand something. We often have times in life where we're praying for people. Maybe right now you're praying for someone who you know is lost, and you're praying for their salvation, and you don't see any movement. Maybe you're praying for someone's healing, and they're not getting any better. Maybe you're praying for clear direction in your employment, in some relationship, or some situation, and you're no clearer in your thought. You're dazed and confused, not sure what to do or where to go. And this can leave us thinking, like Stan, why bother praying? See, so if you've ever been there, if you're not in that type of situation right now, I've got some good news for you. Because your text is going to show you why you want to pray, pray, and pray some more, and pray with confidence. You know why? You ready for this? When you pray, God hears you. Isn't that amazing? That's what this text shows. Take a walk with me back in the late first century. And here's what I want you to see this morning. I want you to see first, life comes from God. Second, God hears you pray. <clears throat> and third, pray with confidence. And this leads us to our big idea. I want you to hear these words, get them down, and let them be why you never find yourself like Stan saying, why God would pray? But you always pray, because you know you can pray with boldness. Because here's your big idea. Pray with confidence, knowing God hears you. So first, life comes from God. If you ever feel, ever find yourself in a situation where you're praying and it seems like God ain't listening and you're saying, why should I bother to pray? I want you to stop in that moment and think of one thing. Think of your salvation. How did you get saved? Remember how you're going about your life, minding your own business, just content to live how you were, not focused on God or his church or his word, just doing your own thing. And what happened? Somebody. Somebody in your life, somebody that God brought into your life, was praying for you. They cared enough about you to pray for you. 
I don't care if you grew up in a Christian home or a pagan home, you had somebody who cared enough about you to take time to pray and probably spent countless hours and many a sleepless night praying for your salvation. And so they prayed and shared God's word, and guess what happened? You got saved. That's why you're here this morning. That's how you see the power of prayer, and that's how you know God hears you. And that's why you never want to give up on prayer. Even when it seems like God ain't listening, because God brought you to saving life through someone else's prayer. You realize that? And that shows how life comes from God. Just like John's driving out of their text. Look how our text begins here in verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. This shows how life comes from God. John's not praying to a bunch of unbelievers, a bunch of pagans, begging and pleading them, come to Jesus, you need to repent of your sins. That's not his message in this book, is it? That's not who he's writing to. Who's he writing to? He's writing to the church. He's writing to all of you here this morning who profess Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. And how do you know that? Look at your text, look what it says. I write to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. This shows that John is speaking to you. God is speaking to you this morning if you profess Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. So you better pay attention, you better hear. Because what's he telling you? He's saying, I'm speaking to you about all these things. Well, what things? What things are he saying? We just read three verses. What things are he talking about? Everything from chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 5, verse 12. That's these things that he's writing about and talking about. And what's he talking about throughout the letter of 1 John? How Jesus Christ is your advocate, serves as a propitiation of your sins, appeases God's wrath for you, dies and goes to the cross so you might live. And that makes you new. And that means you're different. And that's why you get a confidence when you pray. Because you belong to God. He's changed you. That's what John's getting at here. He's making clear how Jesus Christ is God himself, who is willing to leave his throne in heaven, walk in perfect obedience to the law, and go to the cross and die for your sins. That changes you. That makes a difference. It changes your perspective. So you now know when it doesn't seem like God's not listening, maybe I need not pray less, but pray more. That's the idea. Because look what again he's saying. I write these things to you who believe. So hear this now. When he says these things, he's talking about the Son of God. You know who the Son of God is? That's Jesus Christ, God himself, who took humanity to himself, became what he wasn't. So why did he do that? So you go to the cross for your sins. So you don't have to die for them. But you be raised from death to life. And that's how you see, through your own conversion, how God brings life. Life comes through God, and he uses prayer to do it. And how do you see this? How John ends verse 13. Look what he says here. That you may know that you have eternal life. This drives home, makes clear, highlights how life comes from God. Look what John is saying here. The whole purpose of John writing this letter is to drive home that you have eternal life. 1 John 5.13, this is John's purpose statement. Why did he write this letter? So you know and never doubt that you have eternal life. You ever doubt that? You ever wonder if you're truly saved? See, you need to understand something. If you know Jesus Christ, the personal work of Jesus Christ in a personal saving way, then you have eternal life. It doesn't depend on what you think, how you feel, what you're going through in your circumstances. It depends on the personal work of Jesus Christ. His promises that you receive through the spirit brought you need. And that makes a difference. That's what he does for you. And what this means is, when he says you have eternal life, this is not some future hope for expectation. This is a present reality. Look at the words in your text today. Pay careful attention to the words John uses here. He says, not you will have, but he says, you have eternal life. It's a present reality. How are you not smiling when you hear that? You have eternal life. That's what John's reminding you of right here because of what God has done for you. That's why you always want to be in prayer. Because he calls you to do just that. He gives you the means of grace. He brings you in a right relationship. Because Jesus Christ redeems you. He's the one mediator between you and God. So that relationship's restored. And that means when he says you have eternal life, it's because of your possession. Or better yet, because you're possessed by 
Jesus Christ. You are his. He claimed you as his own. Think about that. All the people in the world, he said, I want you, and you, and you, and you, and you. You're going to be mine. Isn't that amazing? That's what he does for you? And he says, and to assure you of this, come to me and pray. Pray to me. Know that God hears you when you pray. And you see this because John doesn't just say here, but in John 17, 3, he says you have eternal life. And how do you say it? He tells you what eternal life is. This is eternal life. That you know the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom God sends. So God, John is making clear here. God is saying to you this morning, if you know Jesus Christ, then guess what? You have eternal life. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, you haven't confessed your sins, humbled your heart, bowed your knee, then guess what? You're condemned. But you don't have to stay there. You can turn. Cry out. Pray knowing God hears you. And you know what happens? He changes your heart. And you have eternal life. And that gives you great confidence and assurance for your prayers. And this shows you so clearly how eternal life doesn't depend on you, but life comes from God. And I want you to think about this. Think about what this means for your prayer life. That God called you to himself, brought you from death to life, and says he hears you when you pray. You know what that means? You can pray with boldness and full confidence, knowing that God's attentively and actively listening when you pray. You know why? Because the one you're praying to is your God who chose you. God hears you. That's why you want to pray more and more, not less and less. You're his beloved child. And you need to remember this. You need to hear this. Why do you think John's writing this letter? Do you know what happens oftentimes? We're praying. God doesn't seem to be listening. It seems like what we're asking for is not happening. So we start saying, you know what? When I look at God's word, I know he says he hears me. He hears the prayers of the righteous. I know the problem. I'm not righteous. I'm probably not a Christian. I'm probably not saved. My sin is too big for Christ to handle. I'm no good. You ever start doing that? Start doubting your salvation? Start doubting your faith and saying, that's why God ain't listening? Well, hear God this morning. You are his adopted son and daughter. He never lets you go. He can't undo it. He hears you. And that makes all the difference. Because you're reminded that you're his child. Because he chose you. Think about your own children. Did they ask to be born? No. You had them. God gave them to you. And he does the same for you. He draws you to himself. And that means you have great assurance. You never have to doubt your salvation. Because it doesn't rest on you. But it rests in Jesus Christ. And the work he does. And you see it in his promises. So what that means is... When you're worried, when you're doubting, when you're questioning your faith, say, you know what, this is a good thing. Because an unbeliever doesn't care about their faith. Only a believer questions, am I doing what's right? God really using me. And that gives you assurance. And then when that happens, you can pray with confidence, knowing God hears you. And if you're not sure how to do this, how to pray in this way, where God really hears you, you really have this confident boldness, I've got a great answer for you. It's going to shock you. We're doing something here. Five days from now, Revival Prayer Weekend. You can come out Friday night, Saturday and Sunday, and learn how to pray how God taught you to pray. <laughs> pray not for your will, but His will to be done. Pray for His kingdom to come. Not for your kingdom to be established on earth, but His kingdom to be established. So why not make plans now to come out and join your brothers and sisters and learn how to pray and get that confidence you need knowing God hears you. And that'll cause you to pray, not less but more. And to pray with one another. Not by yourself. I mean, think about when you're trying to handle something on your own. <coughs> trying to lift a 400-pound sofa. Can you do it by yourself? We've well, got 10 people helping you. Much easier, right? Pray that way. If you see God's not answering my prayers, maybe you're not getting enough people to pray with you. Call up your brother or sister. Hey, can you come pray with me? My son is not responding. My sister's not responding. Pray with me. Lift them up together. Do this because you want to pray with confidence. And know that when God changes your heart, you can do that. You can pray with confidence knowing God hears you. And as he does, there's never a reason to doubt your prayer. Never a reason to be like Stan and say, I'm done with prayer. Which brings our second point. Know this, hear this. Your second point. God hears you pray. It's very common for us to be like Stan. To think there's no point in praying because God ain't listening. I'm praying, 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 and nothing's changing. 
I'm praying for this circumstance or situation, and it still seems to be the same. And we can throw our hands up in the air and say, why bother? What's the point? But I want you to think about it. Ask yourself, for what are you praying? How are you praying? And when you're praying, are you praying with bold expectation? Do you pray kind of like, you know, well, God, maybe he hears me, maybe he doesn't. I'm not sure. Not sure if really God wants this. Or do you pray with boldness, confidence? Because you're looking at God's word and saying, here's what God says. So God, you said it. Bring it about. That's how we ought to be praying. And you do this when you know God hears you pray. Ask yourself. Are you asking for God's will to be done? When you're going through difficult circumstances, are you saying, God, get me out of these circumstances? I'm more comfortable, make me comfortable? Or are you saying, God, help me to see your will done through these circumstances. Use me as your instrument. What's the focus of your prayers? See, God hears you pray. He knows what's on your heart. And that's why you have complete confidence in him. And you see this in what John writes here. Look at verse 14, how he begins. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. This is saying you can pray with confidence because you know God hears you pray. This is why John writes, this is the confidence we have. This is serving as a bridge between verse 13, you have eternal life, and what's going to come after verse 14. This is the bridge. It's connected. He's making clear, you knowing you have eternal life gives you the confidence to pray God will be done. That's the idea. Think of it this way. When you have confidence knowing where you stand with God, you don't approach him like a tentative servant asking a boss for a raise. But you approach him like a confident son asking for something you know your father already wants you to have. That's the assurance you have when you understand you already have eternal life. God so loves you, he sent his son to die for you. If God's willing to give up the only begotten Son whom He loves, if Jesus Christ is willing to lay down His life for you, what do you think He's going to keep from you? He draws you to Himself. That gives you confidence to know God hears you. When you pray, God hears your prayer. Especially when you've been transformed from death to life. Jesus sheds His blood to purchase your pardon, to do for you what you can never do for yourself. And what does He do? To build you and grow you? He gives you the means of grace. Word, sacraments, and prayer. Prayer grows you in your faith. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus Christ conquers sin and death for you. He makes you new, and that gives you a boldness. Because you know, just like your eternal life doesn't depend on you, but on Jesus Christ, so does your prayer life. Have that confidence, knowing that God hears you when you pray. John says the same thing earlier in this letter. Chapter 3, verse 21. He says, if our heart doesn't condemn us, then we have confidence before God. You know why your heart shouldn't condemn you? Because you have eternal life. What do you know? Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation out for them who know Jesus Christ. That's the confidence you have. That's what gives you the confidence to pray. So let me ask you. Do you pray with confidence knowing you're God's child that he chose? Or do you pray like one who's not sure? Doubting God's really going to hear and listen to the answer. You ought to pray with boldness knowing God says to do just that. And he makes it so clear in our text. See, if you're thinking, I'm not sure if God's listening. I wonder if God hears me. Don't pray less or stop praying. Don't be like standing and throw your hands in the air and say, I'm done. What's the point? But pray more. Pray with others. And hear what God says to you right now. He says, you can pray with good, full confidence. You know why? Because you serve a big God who does big things. So pray big prayers and expect big things to happen. And here's why. Look at verse 14, how it goes on. Look what it says. Hear these words very carefully. If we ask anything, if we ask anything according to his will, this makes clear that God hears you pray. But there's a qualifier provided, a condition as it were. Verse 14 begins in a bridge, and now he's saying what? You have eternal life, so God hears you pray as long as you ask according to his will. This means... You're not self-focused, asking God, make my life better, make me healthy, wealthy, wise, give me every dream, make it all come true, give me no problems, sunny days all the time. You're not praying that way. You're praying, God, I want your will to be done. And this is where we often get confused. 
You ever wonder what's God's will? We treat God's will as something magical, mystical. I wonder what God wants. Huh? May go pray until he discloses to me. You don't need to do that. You know why? You have his will. You've got the answer key, people. It's his Bible. You know what God wants? It's all right here in the 66 books of the Bible. Read it, know it, understand it. That's God's will. He reveals it to you through his written word. That's how you can pray as his will be done. And how do you know this? Because again, John writes this in John 15, 7. If you abide in me, this is Jesus speaking. If you abide in me and my words in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. You hear that language? If you abide in me and my word in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be done. Just like John just said here. If you ask anything according to his will, expect God to grant it. Expect God to do it. That's the idea here. This is the qualifier that keeps you from praying self-focused, selfish, self-interested prayers. But rather prayers focused on God's kingdom, Christ's church, and God's kingdom purposes. Their prayers look outward, not just inward. It's an idea. We like to pray for our health, our safety, our protection, our comfort. Do you ever hear prayer requests in the church? God, my car is broken. I need it fixed. I need another job. I'm not feeling well. Take away my cough. Oh, and I have somebody who needs to grow in their state of sanctification. How can we other people say, God, I'm stuck with my wife. I don't know how to love her properly. God, I don't know how to submit to my husband. I don't know how to raise my kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Why don't we pray these things corporately with one another? Because we think we're perfect? I hate to break it to you, but you're not. You know how you know that? Because I ain't perfect. I'm messed up. But you know what? i got a God who hears me pray. And I pray, pray, and pray some more, and he hears and he delivers, because I pray in his will, and he changes my heart, so my heart is focused on him. Psalm 37.4, what does it tell you? Most of us know 37.4b, God gives you the desires of your heart. What's 34.7.4, A say that? The key part of this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and will give you the desires of your heart. You see the idea here? Your heart's desires are what God desires. It shouldn't be God over here, you over here. It should be your desires or God's desires. They're one and the same. And you pray that way. And when you pray that way, God hears you. It's the idea of being so inundated in God's word that it can't help but pour out of you like sweat when you go to the gym. Just can't keep it in, right? Just pours out. That's the way it ought to be with God's word. And that should guide you with your prayers. God's word should guide your prayers. Get into practice of praying God's word. Asking God's will to be done and knowing what it is because you see his word. And you know that when you do this, God hears your prayer. And you don't take my word for it because God tells it to you. Look at verse 14. Look how it ends. Look what he says here. He, that is God, hears us. You see that? You hear what you just read? God hears you when you pray. This drives home that God hears your prayer. John's just said so. God has said through John that he hears you pray. As long as you ask anything according to his will, God hears you. And this should give you great confidence. Because it says, God's actively and attentively listening to you. This means, when our text says God hears you, it carries a connotation. That God's not kind of busy doing something else and fixing stuff over here when you're praying. Oh, I'm sorry, what? Did you say something? He's got all eyes on you. He's attentively listening to you, hearing every word, knowing what's in your heart, seeing your tears as you cry. That's how God cares for you. That's how he looks after you. That's how he hears your prayers. That should give you confidence to pray. How do you think about that? Think about this. Think about how your child comes running home, excited to tell you something. It's like when I come home for lunch, Trudy comes running from outside over tires and says, Daddy, Daddy, guess what I learned in school today? And I never say, Look, I only got 15 minutes. I ate lunch. Leave me alone. I sit and I listen. I hear what she has to say. And you know what? That's what your God does. Because he's so much better than me. He hears every word you say. He wants to hear you pray. He's interested in what's on your heart. And he wants to see you pray according to his will. And you know how you know this? Because John's not saying something new here. He's saying the same thing that Peter says. 1 Peter 3.12. Here's what he reads. The eyes of the Lord... Or on the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayer. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to your prayers. And how do you become righteous? Not by yourself, but by the righteousness of Jesus Christ being imputed to you. And that makes you new. And that gives you confidence to pray, asking God's will to be done. That's the idea. And think about this. 
How do you have confidence? Because Jesus Christ knows you can't satisfy yourself. You can't save yourself. So what does he do? He goes to the cross, taking all God's wrath on himself, all your sins on himself, and imputes to you his perfect righteousness. Takes out your heart of stone, gives your heart of flesh, and that makes you new. That means you don't think the same old way, like nobody's listening, God doesn't care. You say, I know God loves me because he died for me. I've got eternal life. See that verse 13, you got eternal life? So you can ask God whatever you want. Because he loves you and cares for you. As long as it's according to his will, guess what's going to happen? You're going to see it come about. Why not give it a try? Do this, do this in the next five days before you come to the prayer revival. Ask God to, you know, what he says in his word. Say, you know what, God? I know you pray, you don't want anyone to curse. So pray for someone's salvation. And ask your brother and sister, pray for their salvation. And do it every day. And keep praying and praying and praying. And watch what God does. Ask God to give you more time to go out and evangelize. And watch how he frees up your schedule. Ask God to make you more fervent in your prayer. And watch what he does with your prayers. You know why? Because these are the things he tells you in his word. To do these things. To take hold of the means of grace. 2 Peter 3.18, you're commanded to grow in grace. And God doesn't give you a command without the ability to do it. What's he doing? He gives you the means of grace. Word, sacraments, prayer. You ever say to yourself, I can pray better. I can pray more. My prayer life could be so much better. Well, then just do it. Just pray more and pray in God's will. Stop finding excuses why you can't pray. Put down your video games. Stop spending all the time out scope snowboarding. And spend some time in prayer. And while you're doing it, be in God's word. So you can pray God's word, you know what his will is. And you pray that way, you know God hears you. Let this be why you come out this weekend to a revival prayer meeting. Because you want to show you know the power of prayer. And you want to learn how to pray with one another. You want to be here with your brothers and sisters. To be on the ground floor as we build a culture of prayer in this church that builds a culture of evangelism. And we see lost souls saved. Is there somebody you know in your life you want to see saved? You're not content to have them burning in hell? Well, you know what you need to do? Pray. Pray and pray some more. And when it seems like they ain't listening, that doesn't mean you need to stop. It means you need to pray more and pray with more people. <coughs> we need to gather together with one another. Understand, you need to put aside whatever is going to keep you away from prayer. And if there's anything that's keeping you on your calendar right now that says, I can't come out the revival prayer weekend, put it aside. Do it next weekend. Be here for a revival prayer weekend. I got to tell you, I was praying this week for a revival prayer weekend, and I realized how faithless I am. Because I was praying, you know what, God? Bring out at least 40 or 50 people. I got 100 people in the church. I should be praying, God, bring out 103 people, each and every person. That's what a faithful man does. So pray that with me this week, that 103 people be here in our revival prayer weekend, and we'll see the power of prayer. Be a part of this. Come out and learn how to pray with confidence, knowing God hears you. And that will embolden and empower your prayers. Which brings us to the third and final point. Pray with confidence. I want you to think about that child whose parent can never say no to. You know the child I'm talking about? It seems like whenever they ask for something, the parents are like, yes, yes, yes. Like every desire is met. Like the parent's only you know, purpose in life is to make that kid happy. They never tell them no. You know the kid with Homer, right? That little brat you can't stand to be around. They don't know what it is to say or no. We know what that is. That's you with your Heavenly Father. Not him trying to make you happy and satisfy you and make you content, but hearing everything you say and never telling you no as long as you pray according to his will. Praying that his will be done, that his kingdom come, and watch what will happen. He will not say no. He will say yes, and you'll see him work through you. That's the idea right here. What it is to pray in God's will, he gives an example in Scripture. Think about Jesus Christ, the night of his betrayal, the night of the rest. How's he the garden friend? He knows what lies before him. His severe pain, his extreme humiliation, his death, shedding his blood to purchase your pardon. And how does he pray? Blood pouring out of him. And what does he pray? God takes his cup. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That's what it is to pray in God's will. And when you pray that way, you can pray with confidence, knowing God hears you. And that's what John's driving at right here. Look at verse 15. Look what it says. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, these words give the basis 
for why you pray with confidence. Because you know God hears you. As long as you pray not for your will to be done, but for God's will to be done. Think about asking your wife. Try this, husband. Go home and ask your wife, you know what? I was reading Ephesians 5. I should be loving you. I want to love you more. Can I do that? They're not going to say no. Like you love me enough. Go ask your husbands. Can I be a better help me to you? Can I help you more? Your husband's not going to say no. You do enough. Go to your boss and say, you know what? I'd like to work you work for you for the next week over time, and I don't want to be paid. You think you say no, no, no? I can't have that. I want to pay you extra money. Well, God does the same thing with you. You say, God, your word says you want me to do this, this, and this. Can I do that? God's not going to say no. He's going to say yes. Thank you for finally asking. Thank you for finally listening. I've been here waiting the whole time. Pray that way. Pray asking God's will be done. Because you know, when you do this, he hears whatever you ask. That's the idea. That's how you can pray with confidence. That's what he's showing right here. Give me that basis. Right? Pray for God's will to be done. So give it a try. Do just that. Ask God to help you share the word with your neighbor who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Ask God to give you boldness every time you walk into the convenience store, the 7-Eleven, the Wawa, or the gas station, you share God's word with the clerk. You get to know their name, and you pray for them, and you follow up and you ask them how they're doing. Ask God to give you that boldness, and watch what he does. He will do that. You know what you'll see? People will be coming to church. People will be getting saved. People will be being converted from death to life. God will use you. Are you willing to pray that way? Or are you saying, you know what? That sounds a little kind of scary. I don't know if I can do that. Well, you can't. But God can. He does it through you. He gives you his spirit. That's why Christ rises from the grave and ascends on high. To send the spirit to indwell you. So you're equipped and able and empowered to go forth and do what God says in his word, what he wills for you to do. So pray to God. Ask him to let you do just that. Because when you do this, you know what that happens? God hears you. And that gives you confidence. Say, you know what, God? I recognize that on the first Saturday of the month, we had this prayer time at Grace Church, and I never seem to be able to get there. Help me to get there. You know what he'll do? He'll get you here. I know that when Chris and Jonathan and Addison go out evangelizing, it's just a three of them. Help me to go out with them. You know what happened? God will send you out there on the streets with them. God wants you to do what he wants you to do. So when you pray that way, asking his will be done, that's what happens. That's what takes place. The problem is we live our lives focused on us, on the here and now. What I want. I got to get all my stuff done first, then I'll go see what God wants. Change that order. Put God first. Make him the priority. God, let me see what you want done. And you take care of all the rest. Pray that way. Know that you do this, God hears you. And understand, when John's saying this in verse, four, you know, verse 15, it's not being repetitive. When he says, if God hears us... He's not repeating what he just said in verse 14. He's actually going on it and giving you a second reason why you have confidence, why you pray with confidence knowing God hears you. He's introducing a new idea. What he's saying is this, that when your prayers aren't self-centered and self-focused, but God-focused and God-centered, then you already have what you're asking for. Think about that. That's what he's saying. Look how he been for this is verse 15. This gives you confidence that God hears you, why you can pray with confidence. Look how verse 15 ends. We know that we have the request we've asked of him. This makes clear, clear why you can pray with confidence. What's he saying right here? If you're asking God for his will to be done, it's already been granted to you. This can be a little bit confusing, so pay attention. Let me try to explain this to you. Verse 15, you already have the request you ask of him. This is being qualified or conditioned by verse 14. If we ask anything according to his will. You see the flow of this passage? Verse 13, you have eternal life that gives you confidence to ask according to God's will. When you do that, you know you already have it to ask for. Think of it this way. You turn 17, you get your license, and you want a car. But you're not good with money. You don't have no money saved up. So you're asking your dad for a new car. And while you're asking him, there's already a new car to drive him. That's what God does. We're not talking material possessions here. When you're asking God's will be done, you know what happens? He's already granted it. Because he wants you to be used by him to bring about his kingdom purposes. To see lost souls saved. To see people learning and growing in their faith. That's the idea. But you have to pray these things this way. And when you do this, you can expect to see things happen. You can expect to see transformation take place. 
Don't pray unexpectedly. Don't pray and get surprised when God answers. I was praying for them, and they came to church. Wow! Expect them to come. Save room beside you for them, knowing God's going to bring them. That's what you want to do. And here's the thing. Just like with your eternal life, how it says you have it right now, not you're waiting for you have it now, it's the same way with these prayer requests. You have it right now. God grants it to you. Look, I understand your eternity is not yet completed. You've not yet been fully glorified. But you realize you are glorified? What's Ephesians say? What does it say you sit? You're sitting right now in the heavenly places. Why is that? Do you ever think about that? How you can be sitting in the heavenly places right now? Who are you united to? You're united to Jesus Christ. That's a real union. And where is Jesus Christ seated right now? In the heavenly places. You're united to him. Where are you at? Right there by his side. And guess what he's doing for you? Interceding for you. That should give you the confidence. That's why you pray with confidence. Because you know, when you pray this way, God hears you. And it's not some distant thing. It's a present reality. Again, Ephesians 5.25 says, Husband, love your wives. Ephesians 6.4 says, Fathers, bring up your children and the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So maybe you're looking at your life and you think, you know what? I don't love my wife the way I should. I'm not raising my kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord the way I should. But I know I should do this. So how can I do this? What's the answer? Well, again, John gives the answer. John 15.5, he's telling us, go to Jesus. Go to Jesus in prayer. No God hears you. John 15.5. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. But, that's not the only passage in the Bible, is it? Philippians 4.13. What's Philippians 4.13 say? You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So when you pray, go to God asking God to fulfill his will through you. And do that. Look at these passages, Ephesians 5.25, Ephesians 6.4. Start praying to God, God... Help me to love my wife better. Help me to discipline my kids better. Why do you pray this? You better buy some bigger pants. You're going to find a lot more time sitting on the couch as your kids are doing more chores and your wife's making you better meals. Because you're loving her better. And the kids, you're shepherding better. And they want to serve you better. That's what God does. He answers our prayers when we seek His will to be done. And this makes clear why and how you can pray with confidence. Because you're not praying for your stuff. You're praying for God's kingdom purposes. And it's just what John says earlier. In 1 John 3.22. Here's what he says. Whatever we ask, we receive from him. Listen to this. Because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. This is just what Jesus Christ does. See, we often think obedience has no place in our prayers. But God cares what you do. What does Jesus say? How do you know you love him? You obey his commands. And what does Jesus Christ do? He obeys his heavenly father's commands. He doesn't see the quality of God the thing that he grasps, does he? He makes himself nothing. Philippians 2, 8, 9 makes it so clear. He humbles himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Jesus Christ obeys his heavenly father, and his name is exalted. And when you do the same, you pray for God's will to be done, guess what happens? He delivers. He lifts you up and uses you. As messed up and frail as you are, He uses you. Because it doesn't depend on you, but it depends on His Spirit working through you. Galatians 2.20 makes clear. What does Christ do? He works through you to accomplish God's purposes. That's why He goes to the cross. To shed His blood. To purchase your pardon. To set you free. So you don't stand before God guilty and condemned, weighed down by your sin, but you leave it there at the cross. You hold on to God's promises. When you sin, what do you do? You repent. And you go back to God. Knowing you're fully forgiven. And God gives you assurance that you're saved now. So humble yourself. And don't seek your desires. But seek God's desires. Ask that God use you as an ordinary means to bring about his kingdom purposes. Humble yourself by praying God's will be done. Ask God's kingdom to come. God hears you when you pray like this because it shows your focus, your heart's desire is not on you and your temporary existence. It's on God and your eternity. And don't lose sight of the fact how we started. You already have eternal life. This is just preparation for what's to come. So use your time preparing. If you've got a big test in history, you don't spend all your time reading about science, do you? If you've got eternity, 
right now, and your head's where your head is, spend your time now preparing for where you're headed. Share God's word. Let this give you confidence. Obey God's command. Look now, do his will. And hear how you pray with confidence knowing that God hears you. Mark 11, 24 says this. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it'll be yours. Do you pray that you receive it when you pray? When you pray with doubt in your heart? You need to pray that you receive it. When John says, we know we have the request we asked of him, that's the exact same thing he's saying. Mark and John are saying the exact same thing. So ask yourself, how do you pray? Do you pray with confidence, expecting God to answer, knowing that God hears you and he will bring his will about through you? Or do you pray like Stan, saying, you know what, what's the point? Why bother? Do you ever notice how impatient we are? How long did it take you to come to saving faith? A week or two? A month or two? Or was it years? Now what do we do? We pray. It's been four hours now. God ain't listening. I'm done. Sometimes God sanctifies us as we wait, as we pray. So you never give up on prayer. Know that as you pray according to God's will, you already have what you're asking. Your requests have already been granted. So pray that way. If you're not sure how to do so, then come out this weekend. Come out to Revival Prayer Weekend and learn how to pray with confidence because you know God hears you. And that gives you the boldness and assurance to pray with great expectations because you know you can pray with confidence knowing God hears you. Stan, he's seeing how God's not answering. He's not getting what he wants. So what's he saying? I need to give up on prayer. He thinks that's the answer. What he needs to do is just stop praying. But what Stan needs to do is what each and every one of you needs to do. To come out this weekend to Revival Prayer Weekend. Where you can learn how to pray. Not for your will, but for God's will to be done. For God's kingdom to come. You can pray that way and you expect to see it come about. Because through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he's brought you from death to life. So you have eternal life. And that should give you great hope and great confidence to pray, pray, and pray some more. And be out here this weekend. Join your hearts together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Put into practice what you pray for. Live out what God's word says. Do this because you know when you pray this way, God hears you. And great things happen. You know what we should see? Every seat in the place filled. Because you're praying. And you do what God says. You're sharing his word. You're going. Seeking to make disciples. So start by praying. Come out this weekend to our Bible prayer weekend. And do this because you know God hears you. Let that give you the confidence to pray, pray, and pray some more. And pray with incredible boldness, with great expectations. Come this Friday and Saturday and come learn how you can pray with confidence, knowing God hears you. I invite you to do that now. Let's pray now. Please join me. Lord God, we do come before you, thanking you and praising you for your speaking to us this morning. Show us, Lord how you hear our prayers, as long as we pray anything according to your will. So Lord, help us to do just that. To cast our desires aside, Lord, to make our desires your desires. Help us, Lord, to pray according to your will. To pray your kingdom come, your will be done. And Lord, through this, through our prayers, give us great confidence that we see you working. Lord, help us to never forget that you hear us when we pray. Let us pray with confidence knowing just that, Lord. So we ask these things, and they match us in mighty name. Jesus Christ. Amen.